When I first moved to New York City, I didn't have access to maps on my phone. And so I had to learn the city. You know, I, there, there was no excuse for it. I had to find my way around. As soon as I got a map on my phone, which is like, you know, a couple of years later, I could feel that, like, my knowledge of the city sliding. And, and, and I would get out of the subway station and, and, and would not really know, you know, which, which direction I have to go. But on the other hand, I mean, we, I think we have access to so much more information than we ever would have been able to have before. Those things are always going to, they're always going to have a benefit and they're going to have, and they're going to have disadvantages at the same time. It's going to take years for us to understand what those things are. I think it's always, you know, for older people, I'm almost 40 so I can put myself in that category. We always like to think that the younger generation is, is, you know, broken in some way. But, but we also just can't. We fundamentally can't understand what, what it's like to be a generation that has grown up with social media, that's, been, that's really grown up inside the internet. Because I grew up adjacent to the internet. And, and, and so we, we look at what, the things that young people are doing with technology and we put it into our own frame of reference and we say, oh, you know, they can't read a map as well. But there are lots of things that, that they can do that we just have no, we, have, we have just have no ability to even think about. So I'm really excited to see what, you know, what happens. What does that generation build? Because they're going to build things that we couldn't even dream of. So, so we have the, this thing happening to us as humans where, where more and more and more and more evidence is being left behind of our experience in the world. But we don't get access to it. What that means is that other people can make decisions based on that information. They can offer us discounts or different types of products based on that information. More and more and more of that information is being used to change the way that we're being insured, to change the way that we're being shown political ads. And, and so we're, we're in this very weird situation where, where uh, more is known about the human experience than ever before, but not by the humans who are experiencing it. How can we get people excited about data? How can we get people empowered to be able to use their own data? How can we engage communities to be able to be thinking about how this data can be put to use? Right now, the conversations are really only happening among the technologically elite, mostly you know, Silicon Valley, the NSA, groups of well-educated white men who are you know, using this technology to, to do specific things. And so what I think needs to happen is we have to be able to put that technology that knowledge, the power that comes with it, in the hands of everybody else. I spent like a summer doing some half-assed programming when I was 14, and then didn't do any of it for another eight years. I think I started again when I was 21. You know, for me, coming back to the computer when I was 20, 22 as a kind of means of creative expression was really liberating, because I think for a long time, I, I was purposely avoiding being labeled as a computer guy. You know, I, I had computers in my life since I was young, but I was always more interested in the natural world. I was more interested in biology and genetics and, and, and the life sciences. It, but what I, what I think I hadn't realized until I started coding again, you know, the end of the 1990s was that computer could be that bridge between math and, and art, could be the bridge between science and art. And, and as an instrument, it, it's really uniquely suited to bringing those two things together. My name is Jared Thorpe, I'm a data artist and the co-founder of the Office for Everything.